Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I am going to read more of our book, Poison Power. We're very close to being finished. Well, not really. We're on. Let's see how far we got this to go. But we're getting there. We're almost done. We're on Chapter 9. Chapter 9 is titled, Alternatives Available to Us. The map on the preceding page indicates the status of nuclear power in the United States as of June 30, 1970. The inset on the map indicates that the total generating capacity of all reactors planned will be some 89 million kilowatts. This represents some 15% of the generating capacity in the United States in 1980. Obviously, there are alternatives available to us. One is simply to plan on using 15% less power in 1980. We shall discuss this important alternative later. But we have another alternative that does not require any reduction in power consumption. Philip Sporn, retired president and now consultant to American Electric Power Company, prepared a report for the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy which shows that the electrical power industry has ordered some 91 million kilowatts more has ordered some 91 million kilowatts more generating power than the projected growth in demand will require wow philip stern uh, and the article is titled developments in nuclear power economics january 1968 december 1969 a report prepared for the joint committee on atomic energy congress of the united states dated december 31 1969 unpublished it might i wonder if we could get it if it's available now because it's so long ago if the 89 million kilowatt of nuclear power were eliminated now Excuse me, if the 89 million kilowatts of nuclear power were eliminated now, the supply would match the projected growth nicely. In other words, it is reasonable to halt the growth of the nuclear power industry right now to await its guaranteed safety development. And meanwhile, we can also consider the alternative sources for electric power. The, and this is a new subtitle. The fundamental question, how much power? All the nuclear critics we know deplore dirty fossil fuel generating plants as much as perhaps more than they do nuclear plants. No one can deny the ill effects of the noxious gases that belch from the chimneys of these plants. As we shall show, fossil fuel plants do not have to be dirty. But noxious gases and radioactivity are not the only objectionable byproducts of electric power production. There is waste heat. Enough waste heat to change our ecology drastically if our projected power needs are real. Subsequently, public discussions must not be restricted to questions like, at what temperature shall the heated water from a given plant be discharged into the public water? Or, how much radioactive waste shall be discharged, excuse me, shall be discharged, there's a map in the middle, uh, shall, shall be discharged in the common air supply. To begin by asking these questions is to begin in the middle of the story. I'm going to stop here, I want to show you what was in the middle. This says, nuclear power plants in the United States, operable, built, and planned. I'm going to show you this. Can you guys see that? That's what they thought when this book was written, where all the nuclear plants were going to be built. We did stop some. The one in Oregon got stopped. We must start with the fundamental question, why more power? It is a question that has been publicly discussed only very recently. The flat, unqualified assertion that power needs are doubling every eight years is not sufficient. Unqualified acceptance of this statement would be tantamount to endorsing the notion that electric power consumption is a desirable end in itself. Today, when environmental questions are paramount, we must question the basis for all intrusions on the environment. We do not know that more power is needed. The population of the United States grows by about 1% per year. 
It does not necessarily follow that a population increase of 1% a year demands an increased power consumption of about 10% a year. It is by no means certain that power asked for is equivalent to power needed. How is the power to be used? The advertisements by our utility friends stress the use of power for lightning hospital operating rooms, running audiovisual aid equipment in our schools, making possible stereo recordings of Brahms and Beethoven, and a host of other culturally interesting things. It is highly unlikely that these uses account for a significant fraction of the present or projected power use. Look closely and it becomes readily apparent, for example, that the Pacific Northwest probably wants its added power to operate aluminum smelters in order to meet the growing need for beer cans and TV trays, TV dinner trays. That these factors are recognized at the very highest levels of government is evidenced by the excerpts from the keynote address at the American Power Conference in Chicago given April 21, 1970 by Carl E. Bagg, Vice President of the Federal Power Commission. Quote, Does it seem possible that it was but six years ago in November 1964 that the Federal Power Commission, in cooperation with all segments of this industry, published the first National Power Survey? This comprehensive nationwide survey was undertaken in order to define and articulate the long-range goals of the industry. Some of the finest talent in the government and industry studied the past performance of this highly fragmented industry. And they observed the developing trends in generation and transmission. And as they projected for future supply and demand for electricity, there emerged a concept a vision, if you will, which was translated into presumably attainable objectives, which were characteristics as, quote, guidelines for growth, unquote. Looking back only the few years since it was published, one has struck by what, in retrospect, was an ex inexplicable lack of humility on the part of the architects of, na of the National Power Survey. Certainly, certainty must have existed even then in the thinking of the utility industry and its regulators. The questioning of the limitations of technology, its direction, and even its values, which was then being focused on other sectors of our society, apparently had not extended to the electric power industry. And if it was, we must have believed that the utility industry would remain immune from these forces. How did this happen? How could we all have been so positive, so blindly certain that the only challenge, the only goal was the one which we conceived, that of continually reducing costs in order to usher in an era of unlimited power? The era of the gigawatt, the electric energy economy, under which we characterized as, quote, guidelines for growth, unquote. I submit that it was engendered by a monstrous sense of intellectual and technological arrogance which was ignored not which ignored not only the limitations of technology but even more importantly the limitation of the vision of its high priests the arrogance of our high priest is spread across the pages of our technical journals and in the National Power Survey as an irrevocable indictment of our own myopia. Today we stand convicted by our own testimony. Unquote. A little further in his talk, Commissioner Baggy stated, quote, Obviously, one of the most significant factors has been the sudden emergence of an almost religious fervor about the quality of our environment which has provided, within the political dynamics of this industry, a substitute for the old orthodoxy, the public's relentless demand for cheap power. Few issues have so captured the public's imagination. The speed with which it was transformed from a benign environmental ethic to a zealous ecologic faith 
has been nothing less than meteoric. Its sudden emergence as a national religion has, has profound implications to our theologians and to the electric power industry. The environmental awakening, awakening will achieve even greater impetus through the nation tomorrow when, in accompaniment to teach-ins, marches, and demonstrations, hundreds of thousands of converts rivaling the crusades of Billy Graham will make commitments to the new religion of ecology. If only that were true, man. Sheesh. So back to the book. And a little later, he stated, quote, In the past, all of us have paid the price for the devastation inflicted upon the household of mankind by an industrial society. But it was assessed as a social cost, which could be measured only to the extent that the benefits of our natural environment were denied to us. The damage was not reflected in the prices paid by us. Thus, the true costs of goods and services were understated to their competitive advantage. Today, we acknowledge that industry and consumers must bear the cost required to put an end to environmental degradation. This social cost must, as a matter of national policy, be recognized as a cost of doing business, just as the cost of preventative maintenance reflects the price paid by the consumer for safety and reliability. Unquote. There is a tendency for the electrical power industry to equate demand for electricity with the need for electricity. On this subject, Commissioner Baggy stated, quote, the market-oriented philosophy reflected in your research effort has another outcropping in the form of promotional practices and promotional rates. While the industry has waged a campaign for an increasing share of the energy market, the success of these skirmishes has accelerated the already sprawling load forecasts and has created a level of demand which in some cases cannot now be met. It is paradoxical that the industry persisted in this objective at the very time there existed warning signs of forced load curtailments through brownouts, voltage reductions, and interruptions of service. In its quest for promoting greater electric use, the industry is now obliged to expand its resources to meet market demand, which has in itself in part created while experiencing difficulties in meeting normal market demand." Unquote. Commissioner Baggy is by no means alone in the critical question he raises concerning electrical power consumption. Just recently, the following article appeared in Time Magazine, December 28, 1970, under the title, Heresy in Power. Quote, in 1967, when Charles F. Luce became chairman of New York's huge Consolidated Edison Company, his first priority seemed clear. Since the average New Yorker then used only half as much electricity as the average American, Luce yearned to boost consumption, and he did. But last week he told a startled Manhattan audience, the wisdom of three years ago is the idiocy of today. Instead of trying to increase consumption, he now wants to decrease it. Luce is, as, is, Luce is regarded as one of the most socially responsible leaders in the utility business. He is also a realist. Crippled by equipment breakdowns, Con Ed has been forced to cut voltage in controlled brownouts for the past two summers. Meantime, New Yorkers demand even more power. Con Ed is all but helpless to supply it because conservationists have won assorted court orders delaying the company's proposed new plants. They argue that power generation also generates pollution, and now Luce has publicly agreed with them. As a long-term solution, Luce last week suggested a new federal ta excise tax of perhaps 1%, on electric bills to speed new ways for generating electrical power compatibility with the environment. Until that luminous day comes, Luce is prepared to take an anti-growth position that other utility men might consider heresy. 
urging New Yorkers to turn off unnecessary lights and appliances, he raises, quote, the serious question of whether we ought to be promoting any use of electricity, unquote. Mr. Luce certainly is to be complimented as a leader in the electric utility industry of the development of the foresight that will be essential for this industry. Not only does he question the wisdom of stimulating electric power consumption, he recognizes the central importance of developing alternative methods for power generation, alternative methods with minimal intrusion on the environment. Further questioning of the wisdom or need for major increases comes from the editor of Science, Dr. Philip H. Abelson, quote, In Science, December 11, 1970, Volume 170, Number 3963, unquote. In an editorial entitled Cost Versus Benefits of Increased Electric Power. Especially important is his criticism of the wasteful use of electric power for home heating and the misleading advertisement which hides the pollution problem involved in electric heating of homes. And I'm going to stop there. I see that we're at 16 minutes. We're on page 214. We are uh, just at the new subtitle. Dr. Abelson's remark follows. Cost versus benefits increase electric power. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to come and do a reading again tomorrow, you guys. Um, please do listen on Mondays to my radio show because I will have the people from St. Louis on, and we do need to spread the word about the catastrophe that's being ignored by practically every media in this country. So put your courage feet on. Talk to you guys later. Bye.